So hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on shaping palliative care policy using a human rights based approach, examining the experiences of people living in nursing homes, their families and staff during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Karen Charnley, I'm the director of the All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care. And uh, just a little bit about the All Ireland Institute, we were established in 2010 to improve the experience of palliative care across the island of Ireland. And we're very grateful to our 27 partners and our funders, which include the um, HSC, for their continued support of the Institute. I know my colleague Mary is going to say a little bit more about the funders of this um, um, exciting project, which we've been delighted to be involved in. Uh, just as a flag uh, to uh, participants, if you have any questions, if you think of any questions during the webinar, if you'd put them in the Q&A function, and then during that section, um, the panel discussion, um, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, um, I'll, I'll ask those to the panellists for you. So I'm now delighted to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Mary Rabbit. Over to you, Mary. Thanks very much, Karen. And um, yeah, just to say we're delighted to be at this stage. It's been a long journey and we really would like to thank the support of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission for funding this piece of research. And we're delighted that they can be here with us today on this webinar and also the support of um, Nursing Homes Ireland. And Deirdre Shanahar is here from Nursing Homes Ireland. She's the strategic clinical nurse expert uh, with regulatory compliance and from the health service executive with Deirdre Lang, who's the director of nursing and national lead for older people. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge the other members of the consortium that supported this piece of research, including the um, older people services in Tallaght University Hospital, in St. Vincent's University Hospital and the decision support service and also members of the Institute's Voices for Care, which are people with palliative care needs, family carers and people interested in palliative care, who supported as well in the design of the research. Um, so first, I'd just like to say that we had this idea back in May 2020 when um, IREC had this funding call to put in a proposal because we were very aware at the time, as you may remember, we were in the middle of the pandemic and we were all, I suppose, as a society noticing the huge impact on people living in nursing homes, their family carers and those staff uh, working tirelessly uh, within the nursing homes and externally to the nursing homes, you know, to support people in nursing homes. And as Karen mentioned, our focus is for people with palliative care needs. And we were very conscious that, you know, there could be an opportunity to look and explore this a little bit further about what experiences were there so that we could add to the body of research evidence in this area and hope to make future pandemic planning and policy changes and look at it from a human rights perspective. Um, so we would also like to acknowledge today, because we know we have colleagues on the line, who were those people on the front line who supported people in nursing homes during you know, what was a very, very difficult time. So we're, we're delighted that you can also be here and all the stakeholders and um, interested people who are looking at this area. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to hand over now to um, the colleagues from University of Limerick who carried out this research on our behalf with the funding from IREC. And first of all, we're going to hear from Dr. John Lombard and he's from the School of Law in University of Limerick and he'll set the scene of the project. And then we'll also hear some of the details from some of the data collection and analysis we did with Dr. Owen Doody from the Department of Nursing and Midwifery Studies in the University of Limerick. So delighted now to hand over to both John and Owen. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for, um, for that introduction. 
Um, as mentioned, my name is John Lombard. I'm a, a lecturer in the School of Law in the University of Limerick, and I'm joined this morning by uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Owen Doody of the Department of Nursing and Midwifery in the University of Limerick. Um, in addition to, to that, we, our, our research team was also bolstered by uh, Blaheen O'Shea, who acted as a, a research assistant on the project. And Blaheen is unable to join us this morning, but just to, to thank her for her work on bringing this project together. Um, in addition to that, and uh, I'd like to echo some of the points that Mary has mentioned, so I'd, I'd like to thank all of the groups and the individuals who have supported this project um, from its inception. Um, during very challenging and difficult circumstances, people found time to contribute in a variety of ways, and the support of the various stakeholders was essential in conducting this research and capturing the experience of people during COVID-19. We would also like to, to acknowledge and thank the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission for providing the funding to support this research through the Irish Human Rights and Equality Grant Scheme 2020 to, to 21. So as Karen mentioned, the, the full title of the project, although it's not on the, the current slide, is Shaping Palliative Care Policy Using a Human Rights-Based Approach, Examining the Experiences of People Living in Nursing Homes, Their Families, and staff during the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> and as, as part of this, there are effectively two strands to the research. The first was a, a policy analysis component, which shifted and changed and developed over the course of the research project. And the second was a, an empirical study which attempted to capture the experience of people living in nursing homes, their family and staff during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So the current slides provides a, an outline of the, the current presentation. And for my part, I'll speak about the, 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 the background to the research project, aims and objectives, the research timeline and how that developed over the course of the project, and some points relating to the policy and guidance documents. At that point, I'll hand over to, to Dr. Owen Doody, who will then share his screen, um, and he will speak to the, the empirical research along with the, the findings and recommendations that uh, flow from the, the research. So you can see on the current slide is a, a background to the research project, and it outlines a, a timeline of the, the development of uh, COVID-19 and the emergence of the pandemic. And I think timelines like this are particularly useful to remind us about the, the pace of change and to underline how our knowledge of COVID-19 was developing. Um, I think it's all too easy to, to look back and uh, assume the level of understanding was far greater than it actually was. And I think there are certainly dangers that come with hindsight. So looking back to December of 2019, we saw the emergence of COVID-19 in Wuhan at that time. And the scale and severity of the outbreak was underlined by the World Health Organization when on the, the 30th of January 2020, it was declared a public health emergency of international concern. The first case of COVID-19 in Ireland was confirmed on the 29th of February 2020. <clears throat> and on the 11th of March 2020, it was declared a pandemic with restrictions being announced in Ireland on the 12th of March, and this included the closure of schools and limits being placed on mass gatherings and so on. The first reported confirmed case of COVID-19 in an Irish nursing home was on the 13th of March, 2020. And by the end of March, it was clear that COVID-19 infection had taken a, a, a substantial hold in long-term residential care settings with little over 20% of clusters or outbreaks um, occurring in this particular setting. And uh, across nations, the, the residential care sector was at the center of some of the most difficult and challenging experiences relating to COVID-19. Um, people in residential care settings uh, have been recognized as being highly susceptible to COVID-19 infection and subsequent severe adverse health outcomes. And this vulnerability has been linked to, to resident characteristics, including older age, a high prevalence of underlying medical conditions, uh, a need for high care support that's provided in collective high physical contact environments, 
And a detailed list of, of these characteristics was set out in a, an effort paper back in May of 2020. And by that time, May of 2020, in Europe, an estimated 37 to 66% of COVID-19 deaths uh, had occurred within nursing homes. So underlined, uh, I suppose, the, the international, um, uh, the fact that this is a, an experience we've seen across different countries. In an attempt to, to control the spread of COVID-19 in residential care settings, a wide range of measures were introduced and were introduced in this jurisdiction. So for example, going back to the 6th of March, 2020, Nursing Homes Ireland moved to, to restrict nursing home visits, and this expanded to the HSE operated nursing homes from the, the 13th of March. And with restrictions on visiting, these varied over time. We saw scheduled visits, limiting the time of visits, um, suspension of visits other than for critical or compassionate reasons. And we saw the, the introduction of window and remote contact uh, visiting, for instance. And nursing homes were therefore under immense pressure in responding to the pandemic. Uh, and the other part of this, or the other element of it, which I think is perhaps often unseen, is that there was a huge pressure to respond to an ever evolving regulatory landscape. As uh, Mary mentioned, around the, the middle of 2020, we felt there were important issues arising here, which had a, a clear human rights dimension to be examined. And this led us to apply for Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission funding to support this research project. So the current slide sets out that the various project objectives. The lead applicant for the research funding was obviously the All Ireland Institute, um, along with uh, Dr. Owen Doody and myself uh, and others being named as co-applicants. The funding being awarded back in, I think, October of 2020. We had a, a wide range of partner organisations that were brought together to, to advise and to facilitate the research project. And we had a, a number of, I think, relatively clear uh, re project objectives identified right from the very outset, and you can see them on the current slide. The first here being the, the need to identify needs and perspectives of people living in nursing homes, their families and care workers in relation to the provision of care during COVID-19 through a national survey. And that's the element that Dr. Owen Doody will speak to. And the second element here was uh, to analyze ex existing standards and policies relating to COVID-19 for public and private nursing homes from a human rights perspective. Uh, this was to be informed by data collected from the national survey. So the ordering of this changed around a little bit. And uh, we also saw, I suppose, the sheer scale of policy and guidance meant that we also had to uh, adapt the approach that we were taking here. The current slide sets out the, the range of partner organisations. So for instance, we were supported by Nursing Homes Ireland, the Irish Hospice Foundation, Tala University Hospital, St Vincent's University Hospital, Devices for Care Group, the Health Service Executive and uh, the Decision Support Service. With Nursing Homes Ireland, and the Health Service Executive acting as gatekeepers in participant recruitment. Um, of all the, the various groups and partner organizations that are listed there, the, the various groups assisted with questionnaire development, participant recruitment, um, and uh, report feedback. And again, just to, to reiterate the comments from earlier, to thank everyone for their feedback and, uh, and support for various aspects of the project. Looking then at the, the research timeline, so a general idea of the research timeline is set out on the current slide. And again, this is where we, we started off with certain plans and we, we had to, to, to respond and react to changes as they, they occurred over the duration of the project. So um, our early work involved uh, developing the, the draft survey. So by January or February, that draft survey went out for a consultation process. Once that was completed, we then sought ethics approval. So, and again, Owen will speak to this at a university and at UHL level um, for approval for the survey to be conducted. Um, for various reasons, it wasn't possible then to, 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 to go ahead with the national survey at that time. And I'll mention that, uh, reasons for that in a minute. So we moved up the policy analysis component. The data collection was completed at a later point. The last few months we worked on the, the report and this obviously brings up, up, us up to the, to the stakeholder event at that point. And 
I, I think at this point, it's we, we often speak about you know, the outcomes from the research, what the learning might be, but there's a, another element I think that's important to capture and reflect on here. And it's the, the lessons that can be learned for conducting research during a, a public health emergency. And I think the first lesson that we learned here was really the need for flexibility in order to achieve project outcomes or objectives. So we encountered a, a lot of delays due to developments which could not have been planned for at the outset. For instance, the, the prolonged lockdown of 2021, and this impacted on the, the possibility of capturing the device of nursing home residents to an even greater extent, for instance. So we had a, a research assistant appointed to, to support us with um, data collection at that point, but it was simply not feasible to, 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 to go ahead with the, uh, that aspect of the project. There was a need to wait for vaccine rollout to be completed before we sought to, to conduct the research. And in relation to the policy, well, this grew at uh, such a rate that the nature of the analysis needed to, to evolve. And I'll speak about that on the next slide. Um, so the detailed analysis of policy and guidelines was planned, but this obviously needed to change by the time we were well over a year into the pandemic. Um, it was, uh, I suppose, no longer feasible given the scale, the revision of policy documents, as well as a reordering of the research timeline. And instead, that policy analysis became more about providing context for the empirical research. Um, in any case, in order to identify relevant policy documents, uh, an approach based on that used by O'Leary et al. was applied. Um, O'Leary et al. published an early literature review um, which was titled COVID-19 Healthcare Policies in Ireland, a rapid review of the initial pandemic response. And this was subsequently published in the Scandinavian Journal of Public Health. The approach we applied is set out on the slide. So we conducted a search of the Irish government website, the Health Protection Surveillance Centre website. This was cross-referenced against HSE, HICWA, and the National Healthcare Service Library website. Um, the result of this was that we identified a total of 313 policy and guidance documents. Um, a search was then conducted to identify duplicates. These were identified, removed, and a further review was conducted in order to identify policy and guidance documents directed specifically at the residential care setting and the provision of palliative care. To get a sense of how policy and guidance grew over this period, it's useful to, to contrast the figures with uh, the results from O'Leary's study. So O'Leary's study was conducted back in May of 2020, and this identified 12 policies that had a particular focus on residential care settings. Whereas by the, the middle of 2021, we could identify 33 policy and guidance documents. These addressed areas of vaccination, healthcare needs, infection control, end of life matters, ethical consideration, visitation, and day services. And these were distinct policies and they didn't include previous document revisions. Uh, for my part, one of the, the elements I wanted to, to tease out from a policy analysis was to see how policy and guidance developed over time, but this was again a, a challenging element to, to actually complete. So quite often it was not possible to actually locate previous versions, uh, even where all identifying information was known. Um, this was also recognised in uh, O'Leary et al's uh, literature review where they noted that earlier policy versions were occasionally referenced which were no longer accessible. Of the various policy areas, the, the final report concentrated on visitors and visitation, palliative care, and ethical guidance, thereby providing context for those later parts of the study. As part of this discussion, um, it, this teased out the role of law and human rights in informing and shaping policy and guidance documents. And I think this is particularly interesting in the context of ethical guidance, where there is a broader question about whether ethical principles or whether law and human rights provides an optimum framework for responding to these emerging problems. So in that respect, I'll just briefly mention some issues relating to, to the ethical guidance. So the early documents here concentrate on principles and values that might be of assistance when encountering novel challenges, but there was really little substantive discussion or acknowledgement of the rule of law or human rights. 
one document that, that stands out in this regard is uh, it's in italics on the current slide and it's ethical considerations relating to long-term residential care facilities in the context of COVID-19. And the guide, this guidance document addresses a, a wide range of issues, including vulnerability, values of home, duty of care, protection of liberty, COVID-19 testing and treatment decisions. And the, the centrality of human rights across all of these issues was recognized at the outset of the document. So you can see the, the quote that's on the current slide. So early on in this document, it provided that during the pandemic, there's a particular need to retain a holistic view of the well-being of residents of long-term residential care settings be cognizant of their rights as citizens, and to be vigilant that in seeking to shield them from infection, these rights are not infringed upon to an extent or in a manner which is disproportionate. The provision of health and social care during a pandemic should continue to be person-centered and follow a rights-based approach. Individuals in long-term residential care settings have the same human rights as other people and must be treated with dignity and respect. The document goes on to, to underline and to emphasize the unique position of nursing homes in that they're a residence as well as being a healthcare setting, a point that we sought to, to also emphasize in the report. The document noted that in this context that there are specific ethical values at risk that need to be nurtured, namely protecting and preserving autonomy, dignity and privacy, as well as building and reciprocating trust and mutual respect. And I think these are among the themes that we really sought to, to explore in more detail as part of the empirical study. So with that, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Owen Doody, who will guide you through the, the empirical data. Thank you. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. And um, John has given an overview of the policy and the context uh, of the project and the partners involved. And it was a great opportunity and a privilege to be part uh, of capturing the this data in this um, unique situation, uh, which was felt by many in society and no more so than I suppose uh, our, our most elderly or older persons um, in society. I suppose, um, in collecting the data set, um, it was a national survey. Uh, the survey was of the residents, families and care workers. Uh, the survey was divided into four sections addressing um, uh, the residents, healthcare staff, uh, the nursing home itself and demographic details. Uh, the format um, uh, was to support uh, involvement. Uh, of, and personal preferences for options for completing the survey. So in, in line with that and to facilitate um, a response and uh, uh, opportunity for people, we um, afforded an online survey, hard copy uh, version and a face-to-face -face, uh, version. Um, uh, the University of Limerick um, uh, and the HSC were both applied to for uh, ethics. Um, so, we got full ethical approval from uh, the Education and Health Sciences um, Research Ethics Committee in the university and from UHL Ethics uh, here in Limerick. And um, those um, ethical approvals uh, then were um, uh, accepted by the HSC and Nursing Homes Ireland for uh, access to uh, sites nationally. Uh, the questionnaire itself, um, as I said, was divided into different sections. Uh, the section for the residents had 13 questions, the section for the staff had 13 questions, and the sections about the service itself uh, had 20 questions, and there were seven demographic questions. And sections um, uh, also offered the respondents an opportunity to provide additional comments with open text. Uh, the data was collected um, between uh, the 20th of September uh, um, which was just after Palliative Care Week uh, and the 31st of October uh, um, in um, uh, 2021. Okay, so um, that's just an outline uh, of the survey data itself. Uh, uh, um, so for the different sections, uh, so question one relating to the person themselves, section two relating to, to the staff, uh, and section three relating to the service. Um, uh, and just, uh, it didn't sh uh, didn't show it there, but there was an option for no comment as well. So people had the preference to opt out of any particular question uh, as well. 
And um, as I said, the open ended questions were part of, of the questionnaire as well at the end of the sections. Um, you know, in developing the questionnaire, we worked with our stakeholder group and uh, partners um, to, in the design and um, piloting uh, amongst the group in relation to the questions, the style of the questions, the type of questions, the relevancy of the questions, but actually more the pilot was really focused about the usability uh, for the um, uh, people that will be completing the survey, the clarity, the flow and the layout of the questions. And um, the questionnaire then there was, you know, that there was three versions of the questionnaire uh, and the only difference was it was the same questions but worded in the context of the person that would be completing it so either the family member the staff member or the resident or older person themselves so um one questionnaire three versions uh, and a user-friendly approach in relation to the um hard copy online or or, or uh, um uh, the actual questions and responses as well in relation to um uh, uh, comments uh, level of agreement or not wishing to comment uh, at all um in relation to the data itself and i suppose that's that's the best people like to hear is you know what did you find and um I suppose uh, I'd like to first of all be conscious. You know, there was we had 118 respondents, 51 from the nursing home staff, 42 from families, and 25 from the older persons themselves or residents of the nursing home. And I suppose um, while we had the opportunity to um, uh, access uh, samples and we were supported by the HSC and uh, Nursing Homes Ireland. Uh, in relation to the distribution of the information uh, um, about the study and the invite and the opportunity for um, nursing homes to participate. Um, it wasn't without its complications. I think you know, there was, we have to acknowledge there was a certain level of exhaustion uh, um, uh, out there uh, in relation to the COVID pandemic itself, the different cycles uh, and waves of the pandemic, the difference uh, uh, in relation to restrictions and, uh, and, and as John said, the number of policy changes and requirements upon staff. Uh, so this, you know, put, uh, had an impact and put a burden uh, in relation to uh, recruiting. Uh, and I suppose um, uh, I would acknowledge also that, you know, there was probably a level of uh, saturation in the environment uh, in relation to research saturation when they were, uh, I suppose, being bombarded with being involved in studies or surveys or uh, um, gathering data, um, uh, be it uh, of a research or a policy nature or a recording nature or an incident nature. So, you know, there was a lot of, um, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, demands upon staff uh, and uh, I suppose to acknowledge that uh, and you know it wasn't you know some nursing homes would did say they would love to but they're just finished um, another study and um, uh, at the time it wasn't right so just to uh, acknowledge that uh, and um, being conscious of that but you know we did have um, uh, uh, as I said 118 responses <clears throat> so you mean to um, the survey itself, you know, um, uh, within I present some of the responses to the questions, but to acknowledge as well that there was, you know, in, in the majority of sections, there was over just over 30 responses to the open ended questions as well. Participants were a, um, aged between 20 and 92 years of age. Uh, so uh, the, the um, broad spectrum and uh, 92 representing the residents or family uh, um, members in some situations uh, because there was a, 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 a partners in the nursing home. Uh, one resident um, uh, of the residents, 5% or um, sorry, five or 20% were from in the nursing home for one year. Uh, um, nine or 36 percent were there two years uh, and 11 or 44 percent were there three years so they had um, uh, I suppose a good period of time living in uh, and residing in the nursing home to share their experience uh, and the staff length of service ranged from one year to 28 years so the staff um, uh, were um, uh, a part of um, the process had good experience uh, as well so um, 
And I suppose, you know, there, you know, there was a breakdown of, you know, while it was generally overall positive and the experience uh, was fairly reported, you know, there was some uh, natural aspects of, um, you know, mis maybe misinformation or not getting information or uh, expressing their vulnerability or expressing their fears or anxieties uh, or expressing uh, their concerns. Uh, or dissatisfaction. Uh, but generally, you know, was information provided uh, um, about COVID and it being clear was very positive uh, and um, they were um, uh, uh, informed of any outbreak uh, of COVID itself uh, within the nursing home. Um, in relation to the different sections, in relation to the residents, you know, there, um, there was a clear um, indication of positivity, um, you know, 50% um, uh, uh, and above was the score for, for the questions, uh, six uh, in the 60% range, two in the 70% range, and five in the 50% range. And you can see uh, the um, responses there, and I won't go through them all. Uh, and you mean, know, I'd encourage people to go to the report to get a, a, a greater overview of, of, of the research itself uh, and uh, the context. Um, but, you know, 50% um, range, feeling safe, 59.9%, 50 respect for privacy, 58.5%. Feeling happy, um, fifty nine point four percent, and being content, fifty seven point six percent. However, you know, you know, natural feelings of being bored, you know, sixty two point seven percent. Feeling lonely, seventy seventy point three percent. Feeling anxious or worried or fearful, sixty three point six percent. You know, which could be seen as uh, scoring high, but in the you know in the context of, of the situation. Um, you know, uh, I suppose a reality, and I suppose how we learn from that, and how we move forward from that, and what we learn from this this pandemic uh, going forward is possible. I suppose um, a lot of these responses could be linked to the restrictions uh, and the isolation or sense of isolation and loneliness, uh, and that's recognised in, in all the other research in relation to the COVID pandemic as well. From a staff perspective. Um, uh, 69.5% reported um, uh, that staff treated them fairly, 83% uh, uh, that staff treated them kindly. So they were very positive, you know, and, you know, generally the scores were, were high, uh, I suppose, you know, but just looking at, you know, um, the level of disagreement, you know, and it's only around the 16 to 19%. Uh, 16.1% disagree that staff support at residents. You know, so like there always is room for improvement uh, in a system uh, and we always strive for, for that. And that's embedded in our principles of the holistic person-centered care, the valuing the person, the autonomy, their respect, their dignity. So our principles, how we live them and how we translate them uh, into practice, there's always going to be room for improvement uh, 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 and support for, for persons in care. Uh, Nineteen and a half percent did um, did not agree that staff provide appropriate care based on their needs, and I suppose you know that you know again contextualizing uh, some of these responses, you know that could be in the context of the demands on staff, and we see later that staff families and uh, didn't comment on you know lack of staff when people went out sick or whatever so there was big demands upon the systems uh, um, and while these are not very large um, uh, figures that um, are reporting this they are notable and something that uh, we, we need to uh, bring forward with us in relation to our lessons uh, and our learning from from this experience from residents staff and families perspectives. Uh, from the nursing home environment itself, you know, there was uh, this was the section with the largest number of questions. Uh, and I suppose it was the section that, you know, was somewhere uh, somewhat a little bit more mixed in relation to the responses. Uh, one question scored in the 40% range, two in the 50% range, uh, 12 in the 60, and three in the 70, and two in the 80. So, you know, generally scoring well. Uh, um, but I suppose some of the positives would be 89.1% of respondents were in agreement that nursing home is comfortable uh, and kept well. 84.7% uh, in agreement that residents have access to communal space to meet fellow residents, so uh, building on that communication and connection. Uh, and communication and connection with family was a vital, of vital importance to residents. 
um, and was supported uh, um, where, the, where the use of alternative communication means such as technology was used in 66.9% of the time, supported to keep contact with family and friends, 71.2%, uh, and accommodation uh, to accommodation to have visits from fa families either physically or electronically, 76.3%. However, you know, looking at uh, some of the lower percentages or areas uh, that uh, for improvement, um, some of the negative here, and again, this seems to be linked to the autonomy and the restrictions that may have existed even outside of COVID-19. Uh, um, 44.2% disagree that residents can get up or go to bed when they want. Uh, and I suppose, you know, uh, that's uh, something that may be COVID and non-COVID related that we might need to learn from and, and look at going forward. 28% um, strongly uh, the, uh, or in dis uh, a level of a disagreement in relations to residents can choose who else is involved in their care. Uh, and I suppose that process uh, and involvement in care planning is something uh, we could look at. 24.5% uh, were in uh, a level of agreement that residents are involved in decision makings about our care. So we can see around a quarter uh, of the sample indicating uh, that maybe greater involvement or inclusion in the care planning process is something we should take going forward. In relation to advanced care planning, 52.5% were in agreement that residents are supported and given relevant information about care planning, but 28% did not know or were unsure, and 2019.5% were in disagreement. So always areas of improvement. Uh, uh, and you know, um sometimes um you know people respond in, in respondents people can respond to a question uh, and be unsure uh, uh, and that that's that's fine too that's not to say that it's not there to them other not wouldn't be involved uh, and so just reporting uh, on what was uh, uh, supported and given back uh, in relation sorry in relation to um um the social connection um you know there was good maintenance uh, of relationships with family um, there was 36 respondents uh, to, to, to this open uh, comments here, uh, and the participants reported uh, to maintain the relationship during COVID, uh, and the traditional vehicle of phone calls um, uh, was one method, other methods were video calls. Uh, and were, were also common, but also nursing uh, uh, home staff reported providing tablets and uh, other forms of technology, face-to-face -face communication via platforms such as Zoom and WhatsApp. Written communication was reported also and encouraged via, via letter writing and postcards and email. And if needed, staff assisted with letter writing uh, and letter reading for residents. And one staff member reported using their own personal phone for residents to contact family members. Uh, and interesting, they've done this covertly as it was, it was perceived as, as something that would not be permitted or being inappropriate. So I suppose um, uh, that that uh, uh, dichotomy needs to be investigated or, or, or um, considered going forward as well uh, when resources are not available um, uh, and the person centeredness aspect to it. Window visits were also frequently implied and sometimes referred uh, to by relatives as a form of safe visiting, so um, they could see that uh, uh, aspect. And some uh, families responded uh, that they were allowed, uh, they were not allowed any sort of visit in person or window visit at times when the advice wa was um, uh, had changed. And I suppose there might have been a time lag uh, between policy uh, and directions uh, and advice given and actually the turnaround time. So um, uh, they they did uh, report getting the contact, but I suppose uh, sometimes the speed uh, and keeping with, abreast uh, um, with the current advice and restriction guidelines uh, was something that was noted. There were some reports of relatives being allowed visits in person and indoor, while others were um, uh, not allowed. Uh, uh, visits seemed to be uh, decided upon compassionate grounds if a resident was unwell or at end of life, uh, and uh, which was appropriate, uh, given the high level of restriction at certain times. Uh, communication between nursing home management and family uh, and next of kin was also facilitated. 
um, and in some instances, staff uh, and maintained contact with relatives on a weekly basis via phone or written email or uh, letters for uh, to provide an update on how the nursing home was managing and generally uh, um, on providing information on the health status uh, of relatives. However, you know, there was some reports of poor communication strategies uh, and some of it were related to infrastructure, having no internet connections, not enough phones or tablets. Uh, uh, and um, when in the cases where their family member may need help, that staff were so busy that they felt they didn't have the time or weren't available to assist uh, um, uh, where necessary uh, um, uh, or at times. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, I suppose, emphasizing the demand that was on staff as well. In relation to care provision, um, you know, 20 uh, respondents, 15 family, five staff participated in the commons. Um, generally, they were uh, uh, kind of reflective of that people, their family members uh, were in a safe, uh, familiar place to them uh, uh, and that they were doing their best given the current terrible situation they were in and that uh, families could see that staff were trying to go and were going above and beyond their duty of care, uh, be it you know, the uh, communication or the engagement uh, or um, the challenges they were dealing with in relation to providing care. Uh, and one of the big challenges uh, families uh, uh, and staff reported was around maintaining appropriate staffing level. Uh, and um, when people were um, out sick, it wasn't always possible to get replacements. So, you know, you were managing uh, on uh, depleted staffing levels uh, at times. Uh, the experience and perception of care receiving the nursing home was described along, a, um, I suppose, a continuum from being excellent and very good to being um, uh, so uh, insufficient at times, uh, and that it was due with the demands. Family respondents appreciated that residents were in a staff, in a safe place, and uh, that carers did their best, uh, and that, as I said, went beyond the call of duty at times. Uh, despite best efforts, there seems to be um, a consensus that there wasn't enough staff, uh, and um, the, there were some, you know, there was some strong wording, uh, you know, um, in relation to it, but it was more in the context of COVID nineteen itself. If COVID nineteen infection did not end lives, then loneliness and heartbreak uh, um, changed life trajectories. And I suppose that sums it up from a family member, you know, that, you know, they're not trying, they weren't trying to blame staff or residents. It was the situation we were, they were in. And that while everyone were trying to adhere and trying to do their best, you know, there was an effect on their family member in relation to the loneliness, maybe the anxiety, the insecurity, and the heartbreak, uh, uh, and the loss, uh, uh, the loss that was um, uh, occurring at the time, uh, and just to be something uh, to be mindful of. Um, the experiences of providing care uh, for, from a staff perspective. Um, uh, PPE, um, well, I suppose, you know, there was, you know, there was a mixed reaction in the sense that, you know, there was kind of a sense of frustration that, you know, we didn't have PPE before, but now in, in the reality uh, of COVID, we're, we're getting PPE uh, and it's available to us. And I suppose coming out of the uh, pandemic and moving forward, uh, you know, what standards are, are going to be upheld uh, and uh, um, brought forward. Um, also, you know, staff, you know, worked, you know, worked around the clock to help residents stay safe during the pandemic. They worked tirelessly to support uh, um, the older persons in their care. Uh, and um, they made a lot of sacrifices. Uh, and they didn't always feel these sacrifices were seen. You know, some there was kind of a feeling that other members of the Rescue team uh, or palliative care or community groups or uh, local hospitals were acknowledged more than nursing home staff themselves who were very stretched uh, uh, during this time, uh, as I said, with um, availability of staff and, and staff being sick themselves uh, from time to time. Uh, there was also a feeling kind of that there was a little bit a bit of this media circus going on and that while it was shining a light on issues uh, uh, and supporting um, and highlighting uh, some issues for nursing homes such as the PPE um, it also kind of emphasized the shock and the fear 
uh, and the personal tragedies uh, that you know was a concern for some of staff and family, uh, particularly staff, you know, in relation to the impact that was having uh, on on residents or, or older persons in their care. So, healthcare staff and relatives expressed you know um, th those views and the views in relation to the working situation. Um, you know, families did comment on that staff just seemed to be so exhausted and they were probably so burnt out. Uh, and that nurses uh, and carers in the nursing home have got burned uh, um, uh, by the stress and pressure that they're under. Uh, and staff reported themselves having considered leaving the work, their work or career in healthcare uh, and may not return. And I think that's a, a stark reality. Uh, and as I said, the, the families were seeing that, that they're burnt out and the pressure and the stress they were under. Uh, and the staff were reporting that they're considering, is this their career? Uh, is this what they want? Um, uh, uh, and will they return to it? And in some cases, healthcare workers, as I said, believed that the public health perception and media was a double edged sword. On one hand, the nurse, uh, nursing home was put in the spotlight uh, um, uh, and that had the positives, but the concern would be going forward that the nursing homes would be forgotten again uh, and no change, lasting change would have occurred. So the focus should be on what when not on what went wrong or assigning blame, but on identifying what the strengths and the weaknesses are within the system and how we can move forward uh, with that. Um, I suppose from a recommendations point of view, um, there is um, uh, the aspect of uh, respect for human rights uh, going forward and how the human rights agenda should inform and shape the development of national healthcare policy and, uh, and guidance documents. National policy uh, public health advisory groups should include persons with experience in human rights uh, and equality issues. Uh, the experience of nursing home residents, their families and staff must um, uh, inform the development of future uh, pandemic planning documents. In this way, lessons learned can be more effective and translated uh, into practice and policy uh, and be more relevant to the person themselves. A focus on strengthening nursing home care and support must be maintained in the future. The attention to nursing home should not be uh, 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 dissipated um, with the reduction of media coverage. So, you know, uh, the lessons learned and how we go forward and what we continue with uh, and what we maintain as a result of um, COVID. Uh, palliative care should have a more central role in national pandemic or epidemic planning documents so as to encourage a rounded response uh, to infection disease control. Um, so, and taking all perspectives in, in, into this um, uh, uh, policy planning, I suppose, is important. Nursing home communication plans and tools need to be adapted for use during pandemic to ensure information is provided in a timely and appropriate manner. Nursing homes should be supported in adopting or developing or adapting and implementing additional resources as required to support communication for residents, such as the pur purchase of tablets, computers, or uh, upgrade of internet connection, connections or connectivity. Uh, I suppose there, that is a resource implication uh, um, for uh, nursing homes and how that will be supported uh, is important to consider. Nursing homes should have a greater support in applying policy at a local level. Inconsistencies regarding what was deemed permissible and safe across different nursing home settings, regardless of public health advice nationally, are a concern and a lesson for the future. And as I mentioned, that, that timely translation of what is safe and permitted uh, um, was an issue uh, in, in, this, in the study. So that's um, uh, an overview of some of the results, uh, I suppose the contextualization of the results uh, and other broadening of the results is within the report and the contextualization in relation to the policy uh, and policy changes that were occurring that John presented uh, uh, before me are, are within the report. I would advise people uh, to, you know, in their own time to link to the report 
uh, digest uh, areas of interest to them uh, and what we, the messages that you would take forward uh, and what we uh, what we could feedback uh, uh, as a group uh, in relation to uh, our own work environments uh, going forward in relation to preserving the humanity, privacy, respect, dignity, and uh, the person centeredness, the involvement and the inclusion of the person in their care and decision making, and there's a, a involvement and inclusion and support uh, for families and the building, the connectivity uh, between families, carers, uh, and the older person or resident uh, in care. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much to John and Owen. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you for the very um, interesting and thought provoking presentation. And I think it'll be interesting to see how we can um, around, I suppose, from the Institute's perspective, uh, of course, working with yourselves in, work, in terms of disseminating the findings from this report uh, through to both the Institute's wider networks, but also through to policymakers and uh, colleagues within the Department of Health and that the opportunities that may arise through uh, the development of the new palliative care policy for adults and uh, taking on board a, a number of your comments there around the importance of human rights being reflected with, within that. Um, so I just like to, um, yeah, I, uh, there was one thing one of my colleagues raised that we do have a human rights and palliative care e-learning course on our learning platform. Um, which is freely available. so we'll circulate the link to that um, along with the report uh, following today's session. Mary, I'm not sure if you have anything further to add. No, I'd just really like to say thank you so much to Owen and John um, and for you for attending today and the really interesting and useful questions and that we will be making the report available and uh, we'll be sending you the link to that as well. Super. So I'd like to just get, thank uh, again uh, the funders for this research, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, the consortium partners of the University of Limerick, HSC, Nursing Homes Ireland, Irish Hospice Foundation, St Vincent's University Hospital, Talava University Hospital and the Decision Support Service. I'd like to do a special thank you to Dr John Lombard and Dr Owen Doody uh, for all of you and your colleagues. I know there was wider colleagues involved in the report as well uh, for leading on the production of the valuable report. I'd also thank Deirdre Shanagher from the Nursing Homes Ireland and Deirdre Lang uh, for the support from the HSC for the support with the report. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to thank um, my colleague Doc, um, Dr Tara Murphy for project managing uh, this report uh, and being highly flexible of, of, as, uh, as uh, colleagues have shared there was some delays along the way some you know and um, Tara was highly flexible I'd like to thank my colleague Dr Mary Rabbit for supporting the project and also um, my colleague Clodagh O'Donovan and me, Marie McKeown so thank you very much to all of you and thank you to um, Tara for uh, putting on your camera there so thank you everyone Hope uh, you've enjoyed the session today. Lots of food for thought. We'll be circulating the report very shortly and um, have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. <laughs>